Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon to you. Okay, for the listeners, my name's Yvonne. My name's Yvonne Christie. And I've got great pleasure, actually, in having these moments with you, Omilade Aladeli. I almost went to call you Dr. Omilade Aladeli, although I know you're Why? not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's because I wanted just to spend a bit of time talking to you a little bit about mm. that topic that you started just the other week, which mm. is about death, death yes. and grieving. And although yes. it was the workshop where there were quite a few guests, I mean, this is an opportunity for you to kind of spend a bit of time exploring further for the listener what death and grieving means from your experience as somebody who's Grenadian, who's got a lot of experience in working with families and individuals around death and grieving. Mm. And I just mm. thought... Um, I wanted to hear a little bit about how you act, what you actually do and if somebody contacts you because a member of their family is dying and or dead, mm. what's, what's your role, Amelade? How do you go about supporting them? In all fairness, I have only supported a family when somebody's dying once. Mm. And I actually found that really scary. Mm. I felt overwhelmed because it was somebody that I hadn't seen for a very long time. Mm. Matter of fact, I knew he was ill, hadn't seen him for a long time and assumed he had passed, but he'd actually moved out of London mm -hmm. and didn't have very much longer on this earth plane and apparently wanted to see two people. Mm -hmm. And one of them was me because he also wanted me to conduct his funeral. Okay. Uh, and I wasn't, I was recovering from an operation uh, when I got that call and I was really scared. And I thought, what am I, why does he want to see me? What can I do? Uh, and what was interesting was that, I mean, I took the train, got there and it was as though he felt my presence even before I spoke. And I spoke with him and sung some choruses and held his hand, uh, spoke with him about the funeral. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I left and I stayed the night talking with the family. And then on my way back to London the next day on the train, I got the call that he had passed. Mm -hmm. So well, that's the only time, apart from my mother, of course, who I sat with for many weeks. Um, that's the only person not related to me who I've, I've sat with when they were traveling. And apart from that, a lot of what I do is to work with families when somebody has passed. Okay. And... <laughs> I, I actually thought you were going to expand. So, of course, right. right. So, so what do I do? Families and do what? Well, why do they come to you? Oh, I, I, people call me because they know that I have certain beliefs around death and dying, um, the importance of spirit. Um, I believe in certain rituals, three mm. nights, nine nights, 40 nights. Um, I believe it's important for families to cohere around what's going to happen to the person who has passed. How will they be buried? Mm -hmm. What do they think they want? I want to find out from the family how they are managing. And I speak with them as a group and as individuals. Because one of the things I realized very early on is that a lot of assumptions are made in families mm -hmm. about the individual's relationship with the person who's passed. How do you mean? Well, we might be related, but we have a particular kind of relationship with that person. Mm -hmm. It might not be great. It might be better than it is for the others. And all of that has an impact on how people manage that process. Okay. So 
if they need me to, I will lead the prayers or the gathering, be it three nights, seven nights, nine nights, um, or 40 nights. So you have to be there for three whole nights, for nine whole no, nights? No, on the okay. third night of the person's passing, there's a gathering. Okay. On the seventh or the ninth night, and the ninth night is the one that tends to be more popular. Okay. Um, there is a gathering. Um, songs will be sung, hymns will be sung, and food will be provided. And of course, certainly as, as Grenadians, we know that there are particular kinds of food. So there's rice porridge and cocoa tea and bakes and saltfish sauce and all those kinds of things because obviously we all come from different backgrounds different yeah, backgrounds. Of course. do you really so what is it about the food what is particular about the food and and, and the grieving well it, it's i'm not sure about the origins of the rice porridge or the cocoa tea it's just that's what we have but it's how we are communicating with each other, coming together mm -hmm. as a group of people who are there focused on the family and also remembering the person who has passed. Mm -hmm. But you know, the other thing I remember is that my grandmother, who I grew up with, um, she was somebody in the community that people called when somebody was passing or when somebody had passed. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things she used to do was to ensure that if the person was passing, that they died without having any unresolved conflict with anybody who they felt it was important to have some resolution with. Okay. So she would actually bring them together. And uh, she did that quite a bit. And also they'd call her to lead prayers. And um, <laughs> a little more oil in the lamp, keep it burning. A little more oil in the lamp, I pray. A little more oil in the lamp, keep it burning. Keep it burning till the break of day. That was one of her favourites. I don't know where that came from. I, I, need, to I need to ask you a question then, because you've just sang a song in the tone that I know feels very kind of religious for me, very spiritual. I just mm. wanted to know, how do these rituals resonate with today's younger Black community? Mm. Because it kind of, you talked about your grandmother and you're not exactly mm -hmm. young yourself. I'm not calling you old, of course, I'm Ilade, but do you understand? I am in my autumn years. In your time, my darling. <laughs> but I suppose what I'm getting at is how important are these rituals for black people? Do we understand it? Do we pass this back on to our young people? Do they get it or do they think we're just making a fuss about nothing? Just talk me a little it bit is, through that. It is complex. Complex. And it, it is complex because... Very rarely do the elders, and we assume they're old people who are passing, although, of course, I've supported families where the people who have passed have been young, some of them tragically mm -hmm. meeting their deaths. Um, but they tend not to have the conversations with you about things like three nights and seven nights, nine nights, 40 nights. Younger, but there is an expectation, certainly, from the older people that the younger people know what to do. Mm -hmm. We also have the complication about culture and religion. So let me give you an example. Recently, an elder passed that I was very close to. And I'd actually helped her discuss a funeral. I knew she wanted prayers. I knew she wanted people to be fed. And what she said to me was, it was important that I was around because she was very clear her children weren't going to let her have that because they are Christians and they don't believe in it. Okay. Now, she was a Christian, but she didn't see any conflict between her Christianity and prayers. Mm -hmm. 
And that is often a conflict and a tension in families. Within families where some people have decided this is what mom would have liked or grandma would have liked. And even though I don't believe in it, I will do what they would like. Mm -hmm. And those who say, I don't believe in it and I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. But of course, for me, it's very important for us to have clarity about how we manage whatever action we take. So if I really don't believe in it and I don't want to do it, that is fine. If I am clear that later on, I'm not going to have any anxiety about, but I knew that's what mom wanted and I've denied her that. Right. And that happens as well. That people then get anxious because they haven't followed through. Because they haven't given. Yes, they haven't followed through. And then they come to you and what would they like you to do at that point? Because they've already made a decision. The person's already not gone through the ritual of the parent or the grandparent, blah, blah, blah. It's too late. What do they want you to do then? Well, it depends. It depends on when they come. For me, I want to find out what it is they want from me. That, that's very important. How can I help you? Mm -hmm. um, and what is it you feel you can do that will not compromise your belief? and how you manage yourself mm -hmm. and that could be a... go on i wanted to know in this conversation it feels to me i've known you a long time for people who are listening i've mm -hmm. known you a long long time before our youngest children were born but i don't think mm -hmm. we talk enough about death and grieving do you think as a community as families do we talk enough about this or do we wait until i don't i'm not just talking about it because this is a covid year i'm just talking about in general do you think these are conversations we need to have more and more anyway so that everybody's needs get met of course we do i know it's difficult but it helps with the grieving that mm. people know where they are mm. um it, it, it helps. It, it is a difficult conversation to have, but it is really important. And it's a conversation to have with everyone, as opposed to just having it with this particular son, daughter, cousin that I get on with really well, and not having it with the people who are responsible um, for putting me to rest, at least my, my bones. So we, we need to be having the conversation. And we need to be it, it's not just, it's also about when you get into the church, because irrespective of whether or not we are Christians, we tend to begin the journey before the, the, the cemetery in a church. Even when some of us are not Christians, hymns will be sung. Yeah. But a lot of the younger people don't know the hymns either. So often I would go to a funeral and you'll get about 10 or so people singing the hymns and the younger people are just moving their lips <laughs> and they haven't a clue what's, what's, what the hymns are. So all those things are important. All those things. Are, we need to be sharing our culture if it's important to us. We need to be doing that. So, so actually then, sort of thinking about um, anybody who's listening to this, what are some of the key points that you think we need to be aware of in order to go forward, just to make this whole passage of grieving easier for us and to deal more. There's been quite a lot of deaths because of uh, the COVID. Flu, COVID. Mm -hmm. At the mm -hmm. moment, you know, it's been a pretty hard mm -hmm. time for black people. Mm -hmm. um, Africa. It has been a hard. It, it has been, been a, hard. a hard time. What do you think are some of the key points to leave us with messages that we can take? take ourselves forward positively? Uh, one of the, the, the things I must say is that we need to remember that we've been struggling with this pre-COVID. And my experience of listening to people is that COVID has actually taken away the choice about whether or not we gather three nights, seven, you know, all of that kind of thing. I feel it's important for us to remember that even though we can't do the be together to sing the hymns, maybe I'm a lunatic, but I talk to people about within families, within the home, even though you can't have the larger community, that you can do your small ceremony yourself. You know, so 
the body has gone, it's COVID, you haven't seen them, you go back to your home, you can cook food. Their favourite food. Eat together. The food that the person, I, I'm a great believer in cooking the food that I've enjoyed with that person, that I know they like. Mm-hmm. Eating the food, talking about them, singing the hymns, reminiscing. Those things are important. And going forward, are we going to do 40 nights? Will we do it here? What will we have? What are you cooking? What are you not cooking? They say you mustn't talk ill of the dead. But for some people, they do need to say, well, when this person did that, I was upset. Because that is also part of the process of grieving. Mm -hmm. And we need to be aware that people grieve differently. So in our culture, somebody dies, you're bawling, you're bawling, oh God, oh God, oh God, smart running, all of those things. There are some people who actually don't do that. I remember when my father passed, my older sister didn't cry once. Mm. And everybody was looking at her really strangely because she's not crying. But mm. it doesn't mean that she wasn't grieving mm. and she wasn't hurt. But she, that's just not her way. Mm. So, so it's important for us to remember that. And also, there's another thing that happens with grieving. I mean, both my parents have died. Um, mm. And the thing that I think I shared once with you when we were talking about this is it links in with the food. Um, mm. so the ritual, uh, my family's Jamaican, I'm Jamaican, the last one born there. And every mm. minute the door was knocking. And all I was thinking when my dad died was my mum needs a bit of space. And there was mm. a ritual of everybody knocking the door, bringing a little bag of something. Bring, But there was also yes. this expectation that I had to keep cooking. And I remember that cheesing me off, actually, because people come and they want food. People come and I had to feed them. And I was kind of thinking, this is a grieving house. Why are you putting expectations on us it felt like that to me i'm a lady what do you think that's changed that's changed because traditionally what happened is that you go to the home of somebody who's passed and you bring food Mm -hmm. because we recognize that the family's grieving Mm -hmm. you can't expect them to be feeding you as well Mm-hmm. The men might bring the, the, the booze because they want to pour libation with that. Um, but you bring food. Mm-hmm. But there's been a change, especially in this country. Mm-hmm. And people expect you to be feeding them all the time. So the grieving family is gone. So of course you'd be annoyed. But mm-hmm. that is not how it was. And we have to accept that things change. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why younger people actually get quite annoyed. Yeah. And they don't like it. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, of course, what used to happen is that for 40 days, the family would be supported. I looked up. And I remember when, mm-hmm. when daddy died mm-hmm. and um, I spoke to mom, they were already at home. And she said, I'm so glad that uh, your father died at home because I have had my support. She said, if that was England, people come. And then two days, you don't see them again. Everybody come at the same time. And then two days, you don't see them. Mm -hmm. Yes. But home people, traditionally, people remember and do those. And they come with food. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're now, we've lived away, we've returned. So we feel we must have something. But often there is a lot of food. Just as the repast, you know, that grand thing you have after the funeral. Back in the day, you go to the cemetery and then you go home. There was no repast, no happy hours, they call it in Grenada, where you have to have a big spread Mm. Um, or a party, as I've seen it with with other families. But it it is that. COVID's made that that not possible anyway, Amalade, is that people can't. COVID has made that not possible. People still feel they want to do something. And you can do your little something at home. But COVID has meant, although I heard somebody say the other day that they were glad that COVID had happened because their parent had passed during that time, quite honestly, because she knew so many people, it would have been too big for us to manage financially. Yeah, exactly. I just wanted you to, just before we close, and just because I know people hear the term libation, we hear it at weddings, we hear about it at funerals. Can you just give a little... 
understanding from your perspective of what that brings to us because you know some people say oh yeah because remember we're all coming from different islands and people have different concepts of what these things mean just give us the flavor of what this means for you but we've been pouring libation for years you know as as uh, as a child i know that even when our my grandmother as i mentioned before she used she did people coming into the world and people leaving the world so um she would be there somebody's having a child and i remember being sent to the rom shop where the father of the child was with his friends and telling him the child born and all he wanted to know was if it had 10 fingers and 10 toes and then taking the bottle of rum and pouring some to the ground it's as simple as as that and it's actually acknowledging the spirits of the ancestors Oh, it's no. as simple as that. Oh, so it's not obvious. If you believe in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Some people might say, yes, it's obvious, but it's what we do. Yeah. It's what we do. And, and also, finally, and I also remember you mentioning during that workshop that actually, mm. where you're from Grenada, you've actually gone to different countries and you've learned different um, rituals from, say, Jamaica, uh, well, I've seen different. Yeah, yes. you've seen different because I, Some people do it differently. Yeah, I went to Jamaica for a funeral, and um, they had they already had the nine nights here, but then they had nine nights the night before the funeral. Hmm. And I was speaking with um, a woman who was born in Jamaica as well, and she was saying that that is also quite new, that they seem to have two nine nights. They have the ninth night, nine nights, but then they have this celebration the night before the funeral, and they call that nine nights as well. I think the most incredible funeral I went to was in Nigeria, and I had never seen anything like it. I thought I was going to a wedding. They had it in a park, and they had all these different tents with different colors. They had... Honestly, Yvonne, hundreds of people at this funeral. They had a live band because the person was elderly and they were celebrating the life of the person. But the other thing they had were each placement, there was a, each placing on the, the table, there was an envelope for money. To pay so eight, but, but, we, <laughs> but we had to give the money as well. Oh. Yeah. Okay, well, let's close. So I think we could talk forever about this death and grieving. Yes, we anything could. Anything you finally like the listeners to hear as a summary of what, anything you feel you've missed? I'm not sure what I've missed. I think one of the most important thing I want to say to people is that it is okay to talk to and about people who've passed. I know that when I did a bereavement counselling course many, many years ago and they said, if people are talking to the dead, then you need to be advising them about getting help from the doctor. And I thought, well, I probably need the help of a psychiatrist because I talk to my ancestors all the time. Mm. And my relationship with them does not end because they have passed because I believe in the power of spirit and it is finding a way for us to live with our grief mm -hmm. and what works for one person does not work for the other so we have to find what works best for us thank you and yes thank you very much I really enjoyed that elaboration of death and grieving and um Maybe a few years left in us before we get to that stage, my lovely. <laughs>